This conference will now be recorded. Welcome, everyone. Happy to have you all here tonight. I'm very excited for this one um, for several reasons, one being which genetics is probably the one subject from school that I just can't for the life of me remember, so this will be a great refresher. Um, <laughs> So I wanted to just first thank everyone for um, attending these um, meetings and for honestly helping to support us over the past year. I know everyone kind of understands it's a bit difficult this year, um, but so if anyone wants to help support us again, that would be really, really helpful. Um, again, the support we've had for this has been wild and we really appreciate it. Um, with that, I'm going to quickly give a disclaimer for the question and answer section tonight. Dr. Haller is a basic scientist, so he does research basically at the bench. So he's sitting in a lab doing his thing. Um, so if any specific clinical questions come up, I'm either going to note them and save them for our next session with a clinical doctor, so like a neurosurgeon or someone of the like, or I'm going to reword it in such a way that it is pertinent to kind of the study of genetics. So, but with that said, I do want Dr. Haller to kind of introduce himself. Um, uh, give us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in Chiari and the related disorders. And then I'll have you do your presentation and then we can do some Q&A. So I'm gonna disappear, <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hi everyone. Um, my name's uh, Gabe Haller. I am an assistant professor at WashU in St. Louis. Um, I work closely with David Limbrick and uh, some of the other neurosurgeons who uh, specialize in, in Chiari malformation. Um, and I was, you know, brought on as a human geneticist um, to the Department of Neurosurgery a uh, little more than a year ago. Um, Having studied um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis um, previously, um, I got interested in uh, the genetics of Chiari malformation um, because of the link between adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and, and increased risk of uh, sp specifically uh, Chiari malformation with uh, syringomyelia. Um, and so, yeah. We started, um, you know, connecting with patients through our studies of scoliosis, uh, who also had Chiari malformation, and um, through that connection, we started collecting DNA samples um, from patients and their family members, and that kind of grew uh, into the studies that I'll I'll talk to you about. Um, and we've been collaborating uh, for a while now with um, some of the other um, groups around the country who have been doing these this this sort of work. Um, in in uh, groups of, of of people with Chiari malformation, and um, for instance, uh, Doug Brockmeyer in uh, at the University of Utah, um, and Allison Ashley Koch at um, Duke University, and and others um, like uh, and so um, let me tell you a little bit about the studies that we've done and how we got there and and um, our um, our work so far, um, and yeah, please. You know, interrupt me at any point with uh, questions, um, and um, I'm happy to try and answer them as we go if if, if you want. Um, so, um, let's see. Let me click. So, I'd like to uh, first start off by saying, um, you know, if any of you on the call tonight um, either have Chiari malformation or have a a relative or a child. Um, with uh, Chiari malformation and would like to participate in our, our study of the genetics of Chiari malformation, um, you know, please go to our website, which is chiari.wustl.edu, W-U-S-T-L here at the top, um, or you can even scan this QR code from the recorded um, uh, talk tonight, for instance, um, and, and, and kind of how this works so far for our study has been um, for the large majority of, of patients uh, that we um, have contacted and, and enrolled in the study, what we do is we send them a, a small package which has these contents. Um, and basically all you have to do is wash your mouth out with some scope and spit the contents um, into a, a tube here, uh, a 50 milliliter conical tube. Um, and that's all you have to do. And the cells from your mouth um, are in that tube. Um, 
and we can collect DNA from those. Um, and so the process, of course, is you know you go to that website, and our, our research coordinator will contact you and um, consent you to the genetic study, and we'll send this in the mail to your house, um, and then you can send it back with this pre-labeled um, um, kit. So just um, you know a little shout out to the the study, um, and if you'd like to participate. Um, and so I guess starting off. Um, you are, all are very uh, well aware of what KRM malformation is, but uh, this is my slide vaguely describing um, the, the population prevalence, for instance, of, of type 1 Chiari um, is, is sort of debated. Um, it's par partially debated um, because the rate at which people have undiscovered Chiari malformation is unknown. Um, largely due to the fact that not everyone has had an MRI or a CT scan of their um, brain and spinal cord. And so um, it's estimated that about a, one in a thousand uh, individuals have um, cerebellar tonsil or uh, herniation sufficient uh, to cause symptoms and then thus go to MRI to, to discover it. Um, but it's estimated that you know above among individuals who have an MRI for whatever reason, around three percent um, have um, Chiari malformation. Um, and again, I, I'm sure all of you are more well versed in these facts than I. Um, but um, what we've seen from our studies of patients, at least at WashU, um, has been that about 35 percent of individuals who have a diagnosis of of Chiari malformation have uh, were discovered due to an MRI that they had because they uh, had headaches. Um, and so uh, I'd say a, a lot of the, um, the major symptom that we see uh, that leads to a diagnosis has been um, headache related. Um, and of course, you all also know that it's likely uh, uh, very often uh, accompanied by uh, syringomyelia, which is a CSF filled spinal cord cyst seen on here on the MRI. Um, so, you know, the question that I get a lot is, well, is Chiari malformation even genetic at all? Um, and as a human geneticist, I always say everything is genetic. Um, you just don't know how much it is. Um, everything has a, a, you know, some predisposition from from your parents, and and. And some things are also affected by um, environmental factors. Um, but the evidence that we have that Chiari malformation is genetic um, comes from a few studies, um, in, in addition to the ones I'll talk to you about. But they largely um, revolve in, in genetic studies about um, the concordance uh, between monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. So those are identical twins versus um, you know, fraternal twins. Um, and so those identical twins have the exact same genetic makeup. And so the more often a d disease or disorder occurs within those identical twins compared to um, fraternal twins who are genetically similar to any two siblings um, indicates how genetically um, linked that disease is. And so um, there's good evidence from Chiari um, malformation that Mon these uh, identical twins have Chiari malformation more often than fraternal twins. Um, and that similarly in familial clustering uh, studies, um, we've shown, we, in, uh, I mean, others have shown um, that affected siblings um, occur more often in multi-generational uh, families than expected by random chance. Um, and so that's another evidence that um, Chiari, uh, is segregating uh, within families. Um, and then lastly, um, a few of the questions that came um, from some of you before uh, the talk tonight uh, brought up this important point of um, co-segregation of Chiari malformation with known genetic disorders or syndromes. Um, and some of those uh, include um, like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, neurofibromatosis, um, other collagenopathies. Um, and I'll get into a few slides about the study that we did a few years ago showing uh, the prevalence of certain um, uh, uh, conditions that often occur within, uh, uh, at the same time in individuals with Chiari malformation. 
Um, so some uh, previous studies have also shown um, some interesting genetic associations. So uh, genes and regions of the um, genome that have um, variants or regions that uh, have uh, that predispose to Chiari malformation. And so these go back um, back to around 2006, um, where linkage screens screens. Um, so these are um, studies in which regions of the genome um, are determined whether or not they uh, co-occur uh, uh, in families with, uh, particularly with the, the individuals who happen to have Chiari malformation within that uh, family. Um, and then there have also been uh, a number of case control studies um, in which uh, basically you take a um, group of patients with uh, Chiari malformation and a group of uh, people who don't have Chiari malformation, and you determine whether or not specific mutations uh, across the genome happen more often in uh, individuals with Chiari versus individuals without Chiari. Um, and that correlation um, is, is referred to as a genetic association, and that can lead to uh, the identification of mutations or genes that predispose to Chiari malformation. And so a number of studies have, have been performed, um, but most of them have been relatively limited um, in their sample size. Um, and that's a very key component of genetic studies is the ability to um, have large numbers of individuals um, allows for the statistical power um, to determine whether or not an association is true. And I know uh, a lot of those terms are maybe um, a little uh, specific to genetics, um, but uh, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, but please, you know, uh, ask questions if you have questions. Um, so a, a bit of the, again, the evidence that um, Chiari is genetic and there are uh, a predisposition uh, to Chiari uh, is the uh, overabundance of certain uh, disorders and syndromes uh, where patients with those syndromes also have Chiari malformation. Um, and some of those are listed here. Um, again, including things like um, overgrowth syndromes um, and uh, uh, things like that are, are quite often the case. And um, syndromes that include um, hypermobility like Loise-Dietz syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, suggesting that there might be a connection between um, these hypermobility um, traits and a risk for PR and malformation. Um, and so in our study from a few years ago, um, where we looked at, um, I think it was around 500 patients seen at WashU and, relate, and other um, uh, hospitals in the, in the St. Louis area, um, we looked at how many of the patients who had a diagnosis of PR malformation also had some other um, syndrome or condition that might be explaining their Chiari malformation. And what we saw was that around 30% of the patients had um, some disorder or condition that might explain their Chiari malformation. And um, many of those were uh, CNS disorders, which I'll go to on to the next slide, uh, sort of a listing of some of those. Um, but despite that, um, around 70% had no other condition other than Chiari malformation. Um, and so that, that's sort of where we're, we're still interested to find new genes and new disorders that um, might predispose to Chiari malformation, but also you know, genes and variants um, that might contribute to Chiari malformation in the absence of any other um, uh, condition or, or trait. Um, and so some of these, um, you know, in genetics, or at least in epidemiology, we call them comorbidities, so conditions that are comorbid um, with uh, Chiari malformation. Um, and some of those are listed here, and I think um, many of you probably uh, know this to be the case, that, um, you know, individuals with hydrocephalus uh, often, uh, more often than uh, the general population have Chiari malformation. And it's sort of unknown which direction that necessarily um, maybe associated, maybe uh, the hydrocephalus is leading to the Chiari, but sometimes a Chiari could lead to some um, blockages that might lead to some mild hydrocephalus. 
Um, and other things like growth hormone pituitary issues are often seen in patients with uh, Chiari malformation. Um, but again, I'd like to, um, you know, not as a clinician, but I'd like to say that I think it's often the case that maybe patients with these disorders have have Chiari malformation, but it's not that Chiari malformation is often the case, uh, leading to these disorders or anything like that. Um, I think um, there is this connection, um, but it's because a similar um, parts of the brain and and um, spinal cord and uh, posterior fossa are affected in 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 these in syndromes and conditions. So, um, you know, we started collecting um, families, um, DNA from many members of, of patients' families. Um, and some of these are uh, shown here. Um, some of you may be in one of these pedigrees. Um, and so these pedigrees, if you're unfamiliar, uh, basically we color anybody uh, with Chiari malformation in this case, um, black and males are, ma are boxes, uh, squares and females are, are circles and the lines represent relationships where um, the lines going up are our parents. So these are the parents of these two boys um, and this patient here is, is the case. And so you can see that in a lot of cases, um, we have large families uh, with many members that all have uh, Chiari malformation. Um, again, suggesting a, a genetic link in these, in these cases at least. Um, and we've had now collaborate, collaborators, for instance, Doug Brockmeyer at the University of Utah, um, and also Alphonse Makaya in Barcelona has uh, sent some of his DNAs from some of his families that he's collected. Um, not, they're not his families, but the, the, of the families he's collected DNA from. Um, and so, uh, you know, starting out doing the genetics, again, we were interested uh, from the get-go um, because of this connection between Chiari malformation and scoliosis. And so we had collected, you know, pretty much close to a thousand scoliosis patients. And we had seen that we, just by doing so, had also collected um, probably a hundred um, uh, individuals with uh, Chiari malformation. Not that that, that ratio is necessarily indicative of the population prevalence, but, um, you know, those are the patients that we see in the clinic with with severe scoliosis and so forth. So um, that's how we started collecting DNA from patients. Um, and now we've now collected um, more than a thousand um, DNA samples from families, family members and patients. And we've sequenced using what's referred to as exome sequencing. So it's basically the part of the genome that encodes the proteins. Um, and so it's only about 1% of the genome, but um, a large proportion of very deleterious genetic variants occur in that region, in those regions of the genome. And so we specifically sequence that part um, of the genome from each individual, partially because it's um, easier to do, um, cheaper to do per person. And so we can uh, sequence way more people this way. Um, and we've also now collected um, many uh, patients without Chiari malformation, or at least, um, you know, patients we believe are unlikely to have Chiari malformation. And we use these, these groups um, to compare um, uh, the genetics to identify regions of the genome um, that are predisposing to Chiari malformation. Um, and so one of the ways that we do that is by um, using what we call gene burden analysis. Um, and, and so uh, instead of using every single um, mutation in the genome, uh, what we do is we actually uh, count the number of people uh, in a group, say cases, uh, in this case, individuals with Chiari malformation or controls, those we refer to uh, controls as people um, without the trait that we're studying. Um, and then we collapse um, all of the individual, we count the number of individuals in each group that have at least one um, protein altering genetic variant in each gene in the genome. Um, and then for each gene, we compare those, uh, those counts uh, in, in the group uh, with, of the cases and the controls, and we do a simple uh, genetic uh, association test, uh, statistical association test. Um, and so when we do that, we get a lot of what we call p-values. Um, so it's the probability of that 
uh, thing occurring by chance. Um, and so the lower, the smaller the p-value, uh, the more unlikely something is to have occurred randomly um, and is thus much more likely to be a true cause of, of the genetic association. Um, and so this is one way of, of, of showing that association. So on the x-axis, we have um, a random distribution of p-values. Um, so that would be the expected distribution of p-values would be random. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the observed p-value distribution. Um, and that those are the ones that we actually see for each gene in the genome, how enriched variants in that gene are in Chiari patients compared to controls. Um, and the more above this red line a, a, a dot is, the more significantly associated that gene is with Chiari malformation. Um, and then they're in rank order. So the top of this line represents the most significant um, gene in this case. Um, and <laughs> we do what we, we call a Bonferroni correction for p-value significance, um, where we basically divide the p-value by the number of tests. Um, for complicated reasons, that's the way that we um, correct p-values to know that something is significant because the more tests you do, the more likely you are to find a very significant p-value just by chance. Um, and so this red line represents um, what we call exome-wide significant, um, which is 0.05, which is a significant p-value, divided by the number of tests, which are, there are 20,000 genes in the genome, so we divide by 20,000. Um, and so the only gene that we saw that uh, passed that threshold was this gene CHD3, uh, which I'll go into in a bit, in, in, in a little more detail here. Um, so this is the, the gene that um, we found most significantly associated with Chiari malformation. Um, and previous uh, association studies have, were, had found that this particular gene, this, uh, which encodes a, a chromodomain gene, which basically puts down um, uh, marks on the proteins that DNA is wound around in the genome. So it, it sort of is a master regulator of gene expression in the genome. Um, and it, it was found that variants in this gene um, cause a developmental disorder um, with a key feature being macrocephaly or um, increased brain, uh, uh, head size. Um, and what we found interesting was that the majority of the variants that cause this more severe um, phenotype uh, or uh, disorder uh, in CHG3 were all focused in this purple area here in the middle, where a lot of the variants that we've seen in Chiari patients are distributed throughout the gene. Um, and our, our hypothesis there is that these variants that we see in the Chiari patients are actually less deleterious um, or less damaging than the ones that have been seen in these syndromes um, and probably cause a less severe uh, condition, um, which is uh, this Chiari malformation compared to these developmental disorders. Um, and so secondly, the way that, another way that we have used um, the, the wonderful resource of the, this genetic uh, uh, cohort of Chiari patients is to use um, trios. Uh, so we take, um, DNA from two unaffected parents and an affected child. Um, and we look for variants that have occurred in the child that were not present in either of the parents, which suggests that either in the, man, uh, the father or the mother, a genetic variant arose in the sperm or egg um, of one of those individuals and then was passed down to the child. Um, and then can only express itself as a, as a variant that causes disease in the child, whereas it only occurs in the germline of the parents. Um, and so we did this uh, sort of analysis, finding variants in, in an in a affected child of a, an affected parent in 67 um, sequence trios. Um, and in general, what you expect to see is one to four rare de novo variants. Uh, so these de novo variants are de novo means new, um, and so it's referring to the, the fact that these variants have arisen new um, in the child in these, in these cases. Um, and so what we found very interesting was that of, of in those 67 uh, tri uh, trios, we found only a number of variants that we found to be pr um, predicted deleterious, 
And what was interesting was that one of those was in a very similar gene to CHD3, CHD8, which is also a chromodomain gene involved in um, very similar um, phenotype uh, characteristics of patients with, those, with the syndrome uh, associated with variants in that gene. Um, again, with uh, autism, developmental delay, and macrocephaly. Um, and what we also found by looking at these, uh, this set of trios um, was that we actually found an enrichment of these de novo mutations, as they're called DNMs, um, in that group of patients compared to what was expected by chance. Um, so if we look at um, genes that are brain expressed, so genes that are expressed in the brain, uh, genes that are known to cause dominant um, conditions, so those are uh, listed in the on, online Mendelian in Man uh, database, OMIM. Um, or if you did take the intersection of these, uh, so brain genes that um, cause dominant disorders in OMIM, we see um, an enrichment of, of these de novo mutations in that those classes of genes in our Chiari uh, trio cohort, suggesting that beyond um, you know whatever single genes we find associated, which I'll tell you in a second, uh, we found one, um, which was the CHD8 gene. Um, there remains more variance in these cases, um, and you can look in the paper to see uh, all the genes that um, have de novo mutations in, in our in the Chiari trios, um, but it suggests that some of those are real and we simply don't have enough uh, patients uh, yet sequenced to, to, to prove that those are real. But as a group, uh, we see an enrichment of, of variants in these in this class of genes. Um, and so uh, that CHD8 variant I was talking to you about, um, we actually uh, contacted uh, a group, uh, a number of groups uh, who had reported uh, variants in that gene, CHD8, um, that were likewise what we call loss of function. So um, they disrupt the, the normal function of that gene, um, either by um, creating an aberrant splice uh, site, so missing an exon in that gene, or creating a stop codon, uh, which truncates the protein and makes it non-functional. Um, and so we found a, an additional two individuals, um, both uh, young boys who um, had uh, Chiari malformation, macrocephaly, and uh, loss of function mutations in CHD8. Um, and so that was very promising. And, and so we actually um, then were interested to know as a group of genes, so there are actually nine chromodomain genes, um, two of which we now have good evidence uh, contribute to Chiari risk. Um, we wanted to know as a group of uh, these genes are very similar. They have uh, many of the same phenotypes. Others have known macrocephaly associations cause similar dis, uh, developmental disorders here, uh, abbreviated DD. And I know there's a lot of numbers here, but what we saw was that um, in our Chiari cases at the, at the time, uh, we, had, uh, we saw 17% of, of cases had a variant in one of these genes compared to only 8% um, in controls. Um, and so, of course, the, the, this association is not causal in, in, in a lot of these cases necessarily, um, but some of these variants likely do can increase risk uh, of Chiari malformation in, in the patients who carry them. Um, and then that also led us to um, think about the re relationship between uh, head size um, and Chiari malformation because um, both CHD3 and CHD8, uh, now associated with Chiari malformation, were also known to cause uh, macrocephaly in the patients with the syndromes caused by mutations in those genes. And so we went back to our um, the patients that we had um, DNA for and started collecting head circumference uh, measurements for them um, and going back into their charts in a lot of cases uh, for patients that we, we could um, and asking, did, did these pa patients have um, increased head size compared to what was expected for their age and sex? And what we saw was that um, despite the fact that they're, uh, you know, in general, within the 95% confidence interval for age and sex here on, in males 
um, are the upper and bottom lines. Um, and so, and here in females, um, what we saw was that the majority of, of patients with Chiari malformation were in the uh, upper half uh, in both cases, and a significant number of patients had above the 95th percentile uh, uh, head size for age and sex. Um, and that's sort of depicted here with histograms. So expected uh, distribution of head size for both genders uh, would be uh, here at zero uh, if we correct for age and sex. Um, and what we see in our in the Chiari patients in our cohort um, that both males and females have about two centimeter larger um, head size on average compared to what was um, you know expected given growth curves um, for age and sex. And this was the case, um, interestingly, not just for patients with Chiari, uh, CHD variants, but for all uh, Chiari patients on average. Now, that's not to say that there aren't plenty of people um, in these cohorts that have normal head size, and arguably the majority of people have normal head size, um, but it is suggesting that in, in, in some cases, there may be a connection between um, macrocephaly itself and risk of Chiari malformation. Um, and then we also did the, a similar analysis um, using um, MRI data. So we have um, MRI images um, for a lot of the patients in our cohort. Um, and what we saw was that when we actually um, took their MRIs and we segmented um, their brains into different regions. So you can do this with a computer program that very accurately um, can estimate the uh, volumes uh, of a brain um, region by region. Um, and then we can compare the average volume of each of these regions um, in our Chiari cohort compared to um, patients without Chiari. Um, and what we see, it, again, similar to our head size um, comparison, was that the total brain volume as estimated from um, MRI was also increased um, at, on average um, in, in Chiari patients here in blue, um, but also that there's this second um, peak here suggesting that there is actually maybe another um, set of individuals here apart from the main average number of, of people in the cohort who have um, even larger um, brain volumes. Um, and interestingly, um, both um, blood uh, vessel size and ventricle size and cerebellum size specifically um, were significant. With interestingly, um, ventricle size, so that's the, sp the space within your brain that holds the cerebral spinal fluid and not actual brain matter itself, um, and is the part that expands in hydrocephalus to, to cause, um, in that case, macrocephaly as well. Um, we actually saw that in Chiari patients, their ventricles were smaller, um, which is consistent with the idea that their brains may be, you know, um, over um, pushing the, the ventricle size um, to be smaller. Um, but it's also, um, you know, the fourth ventricle, for instance, is right near um, where the cerebellum pushes down into the spinal cord in patients with Chiari. And so um, we haven't yet determined how much of this uh, difference is due to differences in fourth ventricle specifically, which may just be um, an artifact of, of measuring due to the um, uh, compression of that ventricle by um, the Chiari malformation itself. Um, so I don't want to take up too much more time, um, but um, I have a few slides about the work that we're doing to, to sort of um, model um, the findings that we have in genetic uh, studies of Chiari malformation um, in in animals. Um, and so we, what one way we've done this is to look at the brains of zebrafish. So they're about this small uh, little fish that we can. Um, uh, change genetically um, pretty easily, um, and they're also transparent, so we can look at them um, under a microscope very easily. Um, and so one of the ways we do this um, is with this uh, now famous um, technique of using uh, CRISPR uh, to um, take a little chunk out of uh, a gene of interest and taking that little chunk out 
uh, changes the reading frame of the protein and makes a non-functional protein. Um, and so we do this in zebrafish. Um, specifically, we've done it in fish that have um, green fluorescent protein expressed in their neurons. Um, and so we can take very uh, nice pictures of their brains and take um, very detailed um, uh, uh, measurements uh, of their brains as a result. Um, and so we did this uh, for the gene CHD8, um, which is very highly conserved um, in zebrafish. So the protein is almost identical um, and thus, you know, is, it's probably a very important uh, protein for brain function um, in humans as well. Um, and what we see is that when we knock out, so uh, we um, basically remove this, this gene from zebrafish, um, a normal zebrafish brain looks like this. These are their eyes. Um, their cerebellum is actually right here. Um, and this is their hindbrain. What we see is that they actually grow much larger brains um, at the same uh, you know, time point. These are uh, both five days old. Um, and if you compare them, you can easily see uh, the increased brain size. And so that's consistent uh, with our findings in, in humans as well, that disrupting of this gene actually leads to increased um, brain growth and thus the, um, the macrocephaly characteristic. Um, so uh, yeah, in conclusion, you know, we find um, that there are these variants in these genes that cause a, a syndrome, uh, but the patients that we have observed actually don't really have that syndrome in many cases and actually have a, a less severe characteristic, which is Chiari malformation. Um, and that, um, you know, macrocephaly or just increased brain size or at least increased head size um, is often observed in patients with Chiari malformation. And that could be from many different reasons. Um, and some of those reasons might not actually be leading to the Chiari, but maybe a symptom of the Chiari malformation. Um, and that we can model um, these genetic findings in zebrafish. Um, and hopefully uh, with larger cohorts, which, you know, we've, We've now uh, up t uh, gotten DNA from another, I think, 200 patients um, that we haven't sequenced yet. Uh, it's in the pipeline to be sequenced. And so hopefully soon we'll even have uh, another study coming out um, with an even larger cohort and find new genes that we can talk to you about next time. So um, I'm happy to, again, take any questions. And I'm sorry it took a little longer than I thought, but thanks. For listening everyone. <laughs> no worries, thank you Dr. Haller. Oh my god, what a terribly unflattering angle. All right, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, first of all, I have a personal question that I want to ask, but I'm going to do a couple of these first. Um, I think I kind of want to start with, it actually just came in the chat, um, how does genetic testing actually work? How does someone get tested? Um, and I guess I guess it depends, but there's a follow-up question. Does that testing go into any other DNA data banks? Um, I, I guess, how does it work? Um, one thing I would add is, does everyone have a CHD3 gene? Um, or is it is it just the change that's associated with Chiari? Or how would, what would you say? Those are good questions. Yeah, I, I, I always take, take for granted um, certain things that, you know, people often in, in, in the media, I guess, say, you know, you have this gene. But it's actually the case that most everyone has two copies of every gene, uh, one from your mother and one from your father. And so what, when people say I have the, the gene, they often mean I have a mutation in one of those genes, um, one of those copies of the gene, um, as, as you were alluding to. So yeah, um, in some cases, people are missing a gene and they have whole chunks of DNA um, deleted, for instance. But it, for the most people, for the most part, people, um, yeah, m actually mean I have a, a genetic variant in a gene that's associated with a trait. Um, and the question about getting tested. Um, so all of all of the studies that I'm, I described um, are m research only. So we we actually don't, report back any genetic findings unless they are clinically actionable. And that's that's kind of a hairy 
question as far as clinically actionable. Um, there are sort of strict guidelines for what is considered clinically actionable, um, which for the most part is variants that are known to cause disease, which is a very high bar. Um, for instance, variants in BRCA1 are often considered you know, clinically actionable, like you should tell the people if you see them, um, and because they cause familial breast cancer. Um, and actually, um, you know, CHD8 variants are uh, reportable, um, but they have to be, uh, you know, identified via a certain clinically clinical genetics lab. Um, and so I would say, in general, if you have any suspicion that you have a genetic disorder or you know someone with a genetic disorder, um, have your doctor contact a genetic counselor and a genetic um, uh, a, a clinical geneticist, and they can get you tested in a in a clinical sense uh, setting, um, and then they'll go through everything to determine whether or not you have a, a genetic disorder. Right. So it's just the difference between the getting tested as part of like a research study versus getting clinical genetics kind of stuff right. going. Um, yeah. So there are a couple of really good questions. I want to do this one first because it's pretty um, basic. Um, what does it mean for a DNA test report to say something is autosomal recessive? Um, in this case, would parents be able to not have the heritable disease, but other families may or may not? Do they have to have it, or, or how does that work? Uh, right, so a, a recessive trait um, is one that's caused when you uh, disrupt both copies, so from your mother and your father, right? Um, and so you're correct uh, in that um, if a child has a recessive trait that uh, more likely than not, neither of their parents would have that trait. Um, and then you have, you know, those, those parents have a 25% chance of having another child with that trait. Um, and the child, his or him or herself, you know, is, uh, will transmit uh, that that um, one of those variants to their child, but unless their spouse also ha is carrier for one of those variants, then their children would not have that trait. Um, but a, a dominant trait, for instance, um, is is only requires one mutant mutated copy of of the gene. Um, so, for instance, the CHD8 uh, variants that actually cause the syndromes are dominant traits, and so that individual would have a 50% chance of giving it to their child, for instance. Yeah. So that's actually one of the questions that just came in the chat. So is, well, they're asking about Chiari, but we're mm -hmm. not quite sure yet. It's kind of all over the place, but what percent yeah. of the, I guess, how much of the CHD8 gene do we think is associated with Chiari? Um, oh, and this is a good question. Is there an increase in brain tissue or just volume? Um, that's a, both good questions. Um, so for CHD8, um, I would say that the exact outcome of, say, a de novo variant in CHD8 is not easily predicted. Um, but I would say you are very likely, if you have a de novo CHD8 variant, to have some spectrum of, of condition related to uh, those things. So it could be mild, uh, maybe a mild learning disability, or, or you could be perfectly cognitively normal and have a slightly increased head size, uh, or you could have Chiari. I, I think you're likely to have some outcome from that, from that variant, but um, it's not as easily predicted what that outcome might be. It could range in severity based on the kind of mutation that you have. Um, and as far as brain volume versus brain tissue volume, that's a good question. Um, it's hard to um, estimate that from M an MRI. Um, you know, it, it's all just images and you can kind of break down white matter from gray matter um, and CSF space from non-CSF space. Um, but it's hard to say exactly what is changing. Um, 
The most significant association is, is simply with intracranial volume. So that would include everything within your cranium. Um, and so it's, yeah, I'd say it's, it's a little unclear at this point. We'll have to do further studies to understand exactly what's changing. So there are a handful of questions about this, and um, I'm not sure how much you've looked into it personally, but do you know what's known about the protein Tennyson X in the setting of like genetics and EDS, so Ehlers-Danlos? Um, mm -hmm. Someone had written in saying that they're testing um, three out of three programs in, in their report predicted the variant to be pathogenic. Um, is it common to see variants of Tennyson in Chiari patients too? Um, it's a good question. Um, so in our study, we don't have an uh, overabundance of, of people with connective tissue disorders, um, partially because we were looking to identify new new causes of Chiari. Um, and so some some conditions are less common in, in our study. Um, but I would say that we we definitely in our cohort as a as a group as a as a whole uh, we do see uh, an increased rate of of all connective tissue disorders um, among the individuals in the study um, and I we have seen some patients with um, variants in that gene. Um, but a lot of them, you know, have already had genetic studies um, done, and so they they know that they have the disorder. Um, yeah, I think similarly, you know, we do see variants, um, yet not quite yet significant, like enough to to publish um, in in some genes similar to that. Um, other connective tissue disorders, um, and so. I think that is is something that we are 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 going to to see more and more as we get a, a larger cohort of patients together. Yeah. So kind of to that, this question came up. Uh, if you've already signed up for a Chiari genetic study, for example, at the University of Utah, which you had mentioned, do you recommend signing up for more, or how how is that working with the data sharing? I'm not even sure. That's a um, also a good question. Um, if you signed up with Doug Brockmeyer, we probably ha you're already in the study <laughs> because he <laughs> he and we uh, like collaborate together. But um, and so he his and our study is is sort of now one bigger study, I'd say. But um, you can always um, you know sign up, uh, and we will be sure to not use you twice. But we're <laughs> happy to have you. Um, yeah, anybody who's interested well, we we can definitely make sure that you're not in the study twice but <laughs> <Here's Kina. laughs> um, so I'm gonna ask some of the questions that came in uh, earlier I'm mm -hmm. gonna start with this one so the, she this person describes they, they have triplets so all boys two identical and one fraternal the identical twins have severe intellectual and physical disabilities and have Chiari malformation. They've both had two full decompressions that were really successful. Then the next question was their neurotypical triplet, the, the fraternal, has not been tested and doesn't show any symptoms of Chiari. Um, no one else in the family seems to have symptoms that are known. Um, so I guess, is there anything known about what are the chances that the neurotypical son could have a child with Chiari one or two they're asking about, but um, I, I think you kind of alluded to this before, but. Yeah, I guess, it, I mean, it really depends on if, um, if the if the Chiari, I mean, I would presume that the Chiari is related to uh, whatever the, the other traits that the twins, uh, well, the um, identical twins of the triplets um, have, but that's not, you know, for sure the case um but it also depends on you know what the genetic cause if there is one is of their chiari and other um conditions and whether or not that um that the fraternal um twin could be or a triplet could be um a carrier for that genetic variant so in that case I, i'd say it's not 
I couldn't say for sure from just the you know knowledge of genetics um, that the 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 unaffected child couldn't be a carrier and then couldn't possibly marry someone who was also a carrier and then produce a child who had the trait again. Um, but I would say it's probably unlikely um, if those two, uh, the twins of the, the identical um, two of the triplet have a genetic disorder that the third triplet does not have. Sorry if that- <laughs> It's complicated, so it's fine. This one's, I think, maybe going to be a little bit easier for you to answer. Um, can gender play a, a role in passing down genes for something like Chiari? So are males or females more likely to pass on a gene um, in any in any way or are they more likely to express it actually that's a separate question um as far as we know we have not seen any predisposition like an increased rate of chiari in in general in males or females that answers part of the question um there is a much higher incidence of scoliosis among females um and so there is this link uh between Chiari and, and scoliosis. And so I would say that some of the Chiari um, predisposition due to its relationship to scoliosis is, is increased in, in, in females. Um, but the likelihood of transmission to our not, to my knowledge is not changed between um, genders or sexes. Um, that is to say, if we were to find something that happened to be on the X or Y chromosome, that would affect the probability of of transmitting the um, the trait uh, to your offspring. But um, in general, we I I don't know. I mean, of course, there are some some syndromes and conditions that are X linked that have increased risk of Chiari, and so in those cases, yes. But in general, I'd say that there's not particularly high relationship between sex um, and Chiari malformation. Even in expressing it? Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And it was a good catch. It's sex, not gender. Good point. <laughs> um, so is there anything known about the genetic connections between Chiari and EDS or hypermobility? I know you kind of showed a couple on the slides, but um, if you could give like a brief rundown on how that might work, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, again, not as a clinician, but as someone who can speculate. Um, <laughs> you know, my my thought has always been um, that um, in general, you, you have joint laxity when you have connective tissue disorders. Um, and so one mechanism could be um, laxity of, um, the base of your skull, um, and that laxity could allow your cerebellum to slip sort of down into your spinal cord. Um, there's also some evidence that, you know, bony um, alterations, again, like in your upper, upper spinal cord, um, uh, spinal column, can, can increase your risk of Chiari. And so some of those bony um, alterations that are more likely in, in connective tissue disorders could also be playing a part. I mean, that being said, there's also um, vascular um, conditions that are associated with connective tissue disorders. And so some um, differences in, in vasculature and, um, and blood perfusion and things like that in, in your brain could also contribute. So I think there's a, a different sort of set of ways in which um, sort of mechanistically these disorders can lead to Chiari malformation. And I think there's a lot of different sort of pathways um, physiologically that can all, kind of all lead to the same outcome, which is Chiari malformation. Um, are there any genetic connections seen with Chiari and trigeminal neuralgia? Uh, this person's mother had had both and two daughters had Chiari. Uh, I am not familiar with that um, connection, but I do not, uh, it, it's very possible, um, but I, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, again, this is all 
being studied yeah. right now. So <laughs> um, I actually, there's a good question. So you work with Dr. Brockmeyer, who handles a lot of complex Chiari. Um, mm -hmm. Have you looked at, I guess, Chiari 1 versus complex Chiari, genetically speaking? Or is that something that's in the works? Or um, I think, you know, currently, we probably don't have the numbers um, of different, like, subtypes of Chiari. I would say that it, it's actually quite a bit more common than one might think uh, to have like Chiari 1.5 or having a low OBEX also in your Chiari. Um, and, and complex Chiari is actually probably more common than it sounds by being complex. Um, but again, I think, you know, currently we don't necessarily have the statistical power to differentiate those, but I think in the in the near future, we will try to, and that's a good good point to, to think about, you know, different genetic causes for different kinds of Chiari. Yeah. Um, this was a question that came in prior, and I'm going to kind of lead to it. So there was someone who was talking about a case study with Chiari and neurofibromatosis type 1. So there's like anecdotal information that there might be an association there. I know you, you included it on a couple of your slides. Do, do you know what the possible basis for the link is between that kind of in gene terms? <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, we've actually, um, you know, sort of anecdotally as well. And I hope, you know, we have better data coming now. Um, we're actually doing genetic association studies with um, using, uh, similar to the complex Chiari, but um, using uh, individuals with Chiari who have increased brain size or at least increased head size as, uh, as a subgroup and looking for genes that specifically are associated with that class of Chiari. Um, and so hopefully, I, I, we have some promising things for a, a number of genes, um, but um, one of the things that we saw, we actually are collaborating with Vanderbilt and they sent, sent us some samples, uh, DNA samples from their Chiari patients. And interestingly, we didn't know beforehand, but two of them actually had neurofibromatosis type one. And so we actually had to sort of think about like, should we include them or not? Because um, again, because of this sort of anecdotal association with NF1 and, and Chiari, um, but actually a decent proportion of people of patients with NF1 have macrocephaly um, also. And so I think at least one of the ways in which NF1 um, can lead to Chiari could be, again, through this, this somewhat new finding of, of macrocephaly in, in Chiari patients. I hope that answers. I'm going to ask the self-indulgent <laughs> question because I started thinking about it. So you talk about brain volume um, appearing bigger in Chiari, the in your sample, um, it's kind of the opposite of the argument that the small skull argument. Right. And I mean, so I guess my question is: Is there genetic evidence for both of those theories? And um, mm -hmm. is that maybe why? And again, this is totally conjecture. I'm talking out of my head. <laughs> um, but is that maybe why that there might be differences in? people's reactions to decompression surgery. So maybe the just the brain is too big in some genetic cases. So I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a couple of points that I can try and make that. Um, uh, one is that I think that there's both sides of the same coin, as, you're, as you sort of alluded to. Um, like craniosynostosis is more common in um, Chiari patients. And so, or vice versa. And so craniosynostosis is the sort of early um, fusing of the sutures of your skull. And so again, that's suggesting that not having enough skull space, um, but having the same brain growth leads to, you know, the brain having, so, have to, having to go somewhere, to put it sort of simply, um, and finding the easiest place to go, which is um, out the frame and magnum. Um, and so I think it's also, you know, a lot of studies have shown that there's differences in, in posterior fossa, you know, uh, volume as well. And so I think that there are different sort of subgroups of, of patients, some of which have maybe a smaller um, 
a bigger brain, some have early suture closures, some have smaller posterior fossa, um, some have you know increased volumes of their ventricles, and that's leading to you know pushing of the brain matter. I think there's a lot of different sort of subtle um, differences, and I, I also sort of think about it as you know um, a very human uh, characteristic because, um, and again, this is me sort of just talking, but um, you know, humans in particular have evolved to have very large brains <laughs> um, on purpose. Um, but we're also mammals, so we have to give birth. I don't, but my wife had to give birth to two um, children, um, and that large head size has to, you know, uh, be given birth to as well. And so there's this evolutionary um, balance between. Uh, having a big brain to be very smart and still being able to be born. Um, and so there's a lot of genetic play there um, in human evolution. And so um, I think some of that, that the, the same kind of genetic causes of our, you know, intelligence as a species um, can also, you know, lead to variation in brain size and brain growth that can sometimes lead to Chiari malformation. It's like so fascinating to me, the push and pull of the evolution that kind of got us to where we are. Um, so is there any um, thought on how environment plays into the inheritance of genes like CHD3 or 8 or anything at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess as a geneticist, I largely study the genetic aspects of things. But yeah, I mean, evolu um, the environment plays uh, an important role in all these things, you know, uh, especially in the expression of of maybe a predisposition that is caused genetically. Um, you know, I've heard of patients who've had head injuries um, that sort of uh, precipitated um, at least finding the Chiari malformation, if not leading to it. I'm, I mean, I'm not. Uh, so, I mean, there are thoughts about that kind of thing. Um, and and there could be you know things like prematurity um, can play a, a big role in um, in various brain uh, development uh, processes, and so it's kind of unknown um, how things like that um, can lead to differences later on in life that can um, be you know manifest as Chiari malformation, for instance. Are there any? Um... And you don't have to know this. I'm making this up. Are there any proteins that maybe from like after a trauma that are developed that might turn on a gene that is broken or? Um, well, there there are definitely like you know genetic predispos uh, you know factors that contribute to the way in which a br the brain um, heals itself or reacts to traumas, um, and so I think. It may be that you know, in the future, we'll find that there are genetic variants that um, predispose to, you know, more more so the way in which your brain uh, or your skeleton or your ligatures um, react to um, environmental stressors like like trauma, um, and so but. but that will require, you know, a decent number of patients that we have detailed information about, like, you know, the fact that you had a head trauma right before you discovered you had a Chiari malformation, and maybe even an MRI before and after in those patients to know that the um, the trauma was the precipitating factor that led to it, and it wasn't just there before, for instance, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. so um, I think there's a lot to be learned, and you know, bigger and bigger data sets will allow us to do that, I think. Um, I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but I just wanna get this question in. Uh, this came in over the week. Um, so someone's bringing their son to a clinical genetics, oh my goodness, clinical geneticist. Um, they're worried that they might ha also have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, is there anything specific that they should be discussing in that genetics consult? Is that something that you might even know about? Or uh, I would probably just say, you know, talk to your doctor. I, I you know, <laughs> I don't want to suggest things that, um, you know, 
there's definitely um you know a, a relationship there that's been observed, but and so you know if your doctor just doesn't happen to know that there's a relationship maybe you should tell them <laughs> and <laughs> find a paper to show them that there's a relationship there and, and say you know maybe i you know there's never a harm in asking your doctor to be tested for something you know so right yeah. <laughs> so i just wanted to go back to this this is probably the last question um because it's related to the last answer you gave. So what are your future studies plans? Um, and how can people on the call tonight or anyone watching the recording get involved? Because everything we've been talking about is all theoretical until we can get the right number of people looked at um, to kind of find these answers. So, but what do you want to learn most? Um, yeah, I think, here, I'll, I'll make, I'll put this up so that people can see it again, okay. but like, go to this website you can um participate in our study but yeah um i mean i think what i want to do is be able to you know collect dna from enough patients and and their family members so that we can identify potentially all the genetic at least causes of chiari um and then maybe that's hopeful because it would take a long time and is maybe impossible but i think we can find a lot of genetic predispositions and then we can understand the kind of, you know, physiology and biological mechanisms that are leading to Chiari, and then hopefully have better treatments or even prevent um, Chiari in the first place by, you know, knowing uh, that X causes Chiari, maybe we can prevent X before it even happens. Um, and so, I mean, that's the real ultimate goal is to like, not just, know that you will have Chiari, but understand it well enough biologically from understanding its genetics um, so that we can, you know, prevent it or at least cure it. So a really good question about this. Are there age cutoffs for being included in the study? No. Um, because I work closely with Dave Limbrick at WashU, he he's a pediatric neurosurgeon, so we often get a lot of younger people with care, but we don't have any cutoffs. So anybody who's interested, uh, and anybody who has a relative, is welcome to enroll, and we'll have we'll, yeah. Awesome. Um, there was another question I had. Oh, um, for other clinicians, because obviously we. There are lots. <laughs> um, if they wanted to get in touch with you, would they go through us or would they be able to contact you directly? I could provide your information to them. Yeah, I mean, if they contact you, feel free to, um, you know, give them my email. Um, I'm sure Dave Limbrick would be loving to talk to anybody as well. He loves talking to um, <laughs> other neurosurgeons particularly, but any doctor also. Um, yeah, and yeah, so our study is actually a very like multi-center study. We have 12 different sites um, that are specifically enrolling, um, but then anybody you know can contact us and we'll send a kit um, to anybody who's interested. Um, yeah, and and so if there are clinicians out there who'd like to be a site, we're also you know happy to enroll them in in becoming part of the study more officially. Yeah. Yeah, and actually that's a really good point. So for anyone on the call or who's listening um, that's a patient that wants to enroll, uh, how does that work with the kit? Uh, does it get mailed to them? Um, can you explain kind of the process, I guess? Yeah, so um, if you go to this website, the kiariwistle.edu research or just scan this QR code, um, they'll bring you to like a red cap questionnaire. Um, and it's basically, do you have Chiari? Do you have a relative with Chiari? Do you want to be in the study? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then when you sign that up with that, um, our clinical coordinator will email you um, and call you if you uh, want um, and go through you know, the consent process and, and, and everything. And it's all online. Um, so there's not even any like real paper. You, you can um, sign consent um, over the internet. Um, yeah, and then we send you this box um, here, and it contains all the things you need to, to um, either swab your mouth if you don't want to actually put the scope in your mouth, uh, or you just uh, swish your mouth with the scope and, and put in that scope into the tube, 
close it up tight, put it in the bag, put it in the box, and the box has this uh, business reply label. So you just tape up the box and put it in a blue uh, USPS box um, on the street or bring it to your mail, mail uh, post office and drop it in, a, in a, any of the normal mail um, receptacles. Um, and it'll get to us with no postage necessary from the person who's sending it. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty easy and there's no like blood taking or needles. And so it's, it's easier than sometimes. This is a really good question that probably gets gone over in the consent process. But um, if they participate in the study, do, do they get the results of their DNA testing or um, how would that work if at all? Uh, no, yeah, the the research, it's all for research, so we're not, you know, actually allowed to send back um, DNA information. Um, yeah, if you have any suspected, you know, genetic condition or want to know your genetics, you, you at, currently at least need to go to like a, a clinical geneticist or through a doctor to get that information back. Because uh, a, a genetic counselor is required to like, discuss the findings with you and we're not um you know people don't have the ability to do that right now yeah um and oh uh is it just kiari one or can kiari 1.5 um how does that definitely kiari 1.5 is perfectly fine um in general we don't we're not currently studying kiari 2 um but we you know um I think in the future it would be interesting too. I think they probably have, in some cases, similar, you know, um, relationship to genetics. But currently, yeah, Kiari one and one point five is is the study that we're currently at going. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna try to end before nine today. So thank you, Dr. Haller, so much for this really awesome talk. And I, the fact that we can even identify potential gene candidates is crazy. So we're on our way. <laughs> um, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And uh, any questions that someone might have after the fact, um, maybe just send it in to either Mary or to me. Um, our emails are on our website. And then if anything, I might send another note over to you, Dr. Holler. <laughs> but, but thank you so much for this, it sure. was awesome. Thanks. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.